I knew I needed someone passionate at the very end to help close this out, and I knew Mike could do that. If any of you have ever experienced his training in the Southeast through South Face, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Mike is very passionate about training with building energy codes as well as code development, but today we're going to be focusing on training. So I'm thrilled to have Mike here as our uh, last presenter of the day. And i got to do the little bio because that's always required. You, you don't have I don't have to? You want me to skip the bio? You know about the dog? and. Okay, fine. Leave the dog. I can just go to Mike. Mike lives in Decatur with his much smarter architect wife Tiffany, two younger daughters, and a wiener dog in a 1920s bungalow that they're continuously working on to sustainably improve. That's good for you? I think that's more important. That's good? Okay. I had a wiener dog. Mike, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, really, hold your applause. It's okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I want to um, start off by uh, asking everybody. To, I'm sure Gene's going to get up and say the same thing, but to offer a round of applause and appreciation for the for the folks that put on this amazing conference. So let, let's hear it. For them. I have learned a lot, and I really, and truly, just about wet my pants when the, the like, governor of South Carolina letter came up. I thought that was one of the funniest things I've ever seen, and uh, I, I definitely appreciate it. Um, uh, a little bit about uh, what we're going to talk about today is, you know, I was asked to do something on implementation, and uh, and I actually feel like I'm, uh, I have some experience on that. I, I don't know that I'm qualified, but um, so that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about. And I took, we I, we do a lot of training and stuff. I'll tell you a little bit about it. But I took a, an example of a, of a presentation that we had been given in the state of Georgia <laughs> based on the ICC 2006. It was a residential presentation. We do commercial and blah, blah, blah. But I just thought we could kind of use this as an example. Um, <coughs> our website, southface.org, that's where you can find a lot of good information. And one of the cool things is we have this, uh, we have this very green building, office building, that we're actually having a grand opening in two weeks. And you can go online and you can actually see that we stuck a thermocouple and a flow meter and a water meter on everything in this building. And you can actually see the performance of our building live, real time. You can get historical data on it. Uh, so we invite you to come look at that. And uh, you can see, like today, what's our, what, what is our photovoltaic system generating and how much is our building consuming and sort of do the math on what we've actually taken from the grid. Um, and if you like some of these training slides, you want to use them, they're on our uh, Department of Community Affairs and Max. Can you raise your hand in the back? So Max, Max is, uh, you know, works for DCA and they post this training slide so we try to really get the information out there. Um, uh, our organization is a private nonprofit. We're about 50 people. We've been doing this for a long time actually, which is kind of neat. Uh, and uh, I was also very encouraged, I don't know if she's still in here, Cammie's in here. And uh, Cammie's from Sierra Club and where's my friend from uh, Global Green? Is he in here still? Yeah, I think you know everybody and their brothers like, oh, Mike Marsick, I got a plane to catch. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Um, <laughs> but I think it's kind of neat that we're trying to tie the environmental impact to, to very pragmatic uh, things which are buildings, and we've, we've all learned that this week as well. Uh, so we do a lot of training and outreach and, and uh, the green building programs and energy assessments and energy modeling and, and, and you know just trying to help, help the marketplace get from where it is to where we want it to be. And uh, um, Earthcraft House is our partnership with the Atlanta Home Builders. So it's our 10-year-old um, green building program that has uh, been very successful and kind of gives you a sense of, of the realm that we work in on that. We're also doing a kind of cool thing. We try to go into areas where there's opportunities, but not much is happening. Like commercial, that's kind of interesting. Uh, we have folks doing Earthcraft communities, and they're doing a great job on, on the land use and the and the residential portion, and then you know you have a, you have a mixed use over retail or something. And there's not it's like well we're doing nothing there, and you know probably not even passing code or something. So we thought we'd try to slip something in that's much more user friendly and less cost associated. And is anybody here familiar with lead for commercial? Raise your hand if you're. Is anybody, is anybody here a lead AP? That's uh, that's lead for commercial. That's great. Uh, I've been doing a lot of that in the last couple of years. This is where the world was when I started at South Face. I don't know if you can read this. It's, 
I remember when there was a damn environment. So uh, it's it's a it's a it's a different world. It's a great world to be in. I mean, we are we are blessed uh, that there's this awareness level, and gosh, there's also money attached to it. So it's, it's kind of exciting to be in here. Uh, I, I, I'm excited. Who am I? That was me. If I were a Simpsons character, that's me. <laughs> um, today we're going to talk about. Uh, the stuff that we've done for implementing the code in the southeast, and when I say that, we pretty much work in climate zones two through four. So we kind of go from Texas to Maryland and willing to travel to places like the Virgin Island and Puerto Rico. Are those guys still here? <laughs> Hawaii, uh, also. Um, so places like that. And, uh, and uh, I think this stuff, as it's written in the code book, is unbelievably boring, but I think that the stuff behind it is absolutely fascinating. So that, to me, is to make this, make this fun. Um, and then I'm going to try something, since there's a few more than, than 14 people, let's try a group exercise and let you do something a little dynamic. And uh, if I had some panelists lined up that I think they also get the tools, we'll see how that goes. And I'm going to wrap it up with my David Levin top 10. Uh, just a little bit more about my region, and you know, Karen, I think, expressed some of the issues and the challenges we have. Uh, one thing about this interesting is us, we have a utility that is, is prevalent in many of these, at least four of these states, and um, they, this is a, a great statistic, I think it tells you something. They, they have twice as many paid lobbyists to fight the climate bill as the next largest entity on the list of having paid lobbyists to fight the climate bill. So, Wow, what a great setup. Wow, this is great. Well, but to be fair, they've also helped us on some programs. So you know, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting, strange bedfellows kind of relationship. And, uh, and then, of course, the land that, that we come from is, you know, we find creative uses for building materials. And, you know, you can put cars on them. And okay. probably some of my relatives or something like that. So anyway, so we, we put center block, anyway, so I'll move on. We, uh, I think one thing is, I was trying really hard not to repeat the stuff that we've all been hearing this week, and you've heard a lot of good information this week. <laughs> I think it comes down to just the two things, adoption and enforcement. And adoption's, quote, easy, right, Karen? Easy, easy, adoption's easy. But the, really, the impact is about, is it enforced? Is it implemented when we're doing something with it? And one thing I think you, we heard from everybody today and, and everybody throughout the course of the week is, oh, we've got it really hard in our state. Oh, yeah, our state is, is oh, the builders in our state, they're doing the, you know, there's all these net, there's all these things working against us. You know, hey guys, if it was this easy, it would already be done. This, this is life, this is challenges. And, and I think, get excited, you know. Um, my state, once more, uh, we, you can combine your trips when you go to, you know, you thought that was funny, but you didn't think this was funny? <laughs> right, anyway. So, um, so anyway, I just realized that, and, and again, it comes down to, uh, you know, get the fire in your belly. And I, I guess I got to go back to this picture right here, fire in your belly. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll not put that up ever again. <laughs> I was like, hurt my other eye. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, so, so basically, you know, get in here and, and realize that, the, the impact of size enforcement. So uh, how can I make something that, frankly, is kind of boring, interesting? And, and it's, I, I've seen other people present code and they're just literally, okay, section 403.214, you know, and it's like, oh my God, kill me now. And, and by the way, in case you can't tell, um, well, what is it, how many attention deficit disorder of mechanical engineering, hey, look, playground. Um, so, <laughs> That's kind of me. Uh, so uh, I think I think trying to find a way to make an issue to me, pictures really make things interesting. I'll I'll show you. Have fun with it. Um, I also think it is uh, we, we very much Mike Dewine was talking about not doing silo training, <coughs> and we really try uh, to to have a mixed audience. I mean I think that actually makes a powerful presentation. Um, it, it is important to kind of hear to, to feel the pain of others and walk a mile in someone's shoes. Uh, honestly, I would talk to any group. If they, if they convene, I will, we'll go talk to them. But I do think it's actually more powerful when you can 
you know, sort of introduce the, the various stakeholders to each other and, uh, and provide weapons, like you said. So code officials, uh, I think uh, simple is, is, is easiest. Um, and we're going to keep emphasizing that. Not to say that code officials are simple people, but they're juggling so much. So we'll focus. The other thing is that, you know, there's some little minutia detail in the code that, that frankly, I mean, if I just said to say, look, what's the five most important things? You're a code official, right? Anybody a code official? Oh, we had a code official. Not anymore? Were you one time? Okay, well, there you go. All right. Um, and I think we just said, look, here's the five most important things that you really want to find. We're going to explain all the other stuff, but just if you can walk away with, with five things, well, let's do that. I think that's important. Uh, you know, but, uh, uh, appreciate and, and, and recognize the, the issues of, of the builder space, particularly in this line, in this economic climate. Uh, and, then, and then, you know, subcontractors can really make or break this as well. Uh, the other thing too is I, I try to relate, at least on the residential side, just about everybody lives in some form of shelter. And so if you can turn the building science into a connection that you've got, I think that's about it. Um, stakeholder network, uh, again, you've probably heard a lot of this, but you know, I started thinking about, well, gosh, if you just look at inspection. Well, there's code officials, and then code officials have their own organization. And, and it's like it starts breaking down in the state of Georgia, just to all these different entities that you can partner with and get this across. And then there's, there's home inspectors and the designers and the contractors and, um, you know, there's actually a lot of stakeholders that can get involved in this. And I think, again, that makes a, a better a better mix than just talking to one group. Um, communicate the impact. One of the most powerful things I took away today was um, <laughs> the whole concept, this fourth, I jumped around, I'm sorry. This life safety and welfare impact on energy codes. I thought that was really powerful. We need to play that up. Because that's, who was it? Uh, was it Bruce? Where was Bruce? You were saying that it's the, or somebody was talking about the stepchild of all codes. I think it was, it was sorry. From Iowa. From Iowa. That's, he's probably also a right? Yeah. Is Mike, are you here? Yeah. Everybody cool's already left, right? We're just, we're just hanging out. So. so um, no, I, I'm including myself. The, uh, the, I think that was a powerful statement, that we're always the stepchild code, but actually if we, we need to play that aspect up. I think it's important. The other thing is... But to, to add to what's, exactly what you're saying, I said is our, the, the reason that every residential building in Minnesota, new building, puts in right. a high efficiency furnace is that they are putting in a sealed combustion furnace that we adopted under our code. And, and that, that is, that was, absolutely, and that is, that is a brilliant strategy. And I, it's funny because I love codes, um, and I, I really want to make it, I, I would say in general, you know, what we're all trying to do is affect change. And I want to encourage and pull and prod, but I still think you should be allowed to, to be stupid in this country. I do think we should be allowed to be stupid. I just think that we should make it so you'd be crazy and stupid to do stupid things. Okay, uh, just you know, a simple example. I think compact fluorescent light bulbs should be 50 cents and incandescent bulbs should be $10. Right? Oh, I'm not banning it. It's kind of what you're approaching. I'm not banning it. I'm just saying this is the opportunity. And, and you know, okay, if you want to buy incandescent bulbs, that's okay. If you're stupid, and you, but you can do it. Um, so that, that's kind of my point. The other thing is, uh, we, we found this argument a couple times was helpful, is play up the, uh, if, if your state, the chances are your state does sell energy efficient products, some of those may be manufactured in, our, in your state. In Georgia, I remember there was a manufacturer of ICF tech, uh, insulated concrete forms. Uh, let's see what else, Max, can you hear me? And there's, a, there's a company in Athens, Georgia that makes, uh, Solar collectors, solar water heaters. They don't sell that many in the state of Georgia, and that's sad, but manufacturing. So it's like, well, there's economic benefit to your state because we're pushing for efficiency and that gets renewable. And of course, you know, the impact of that money, we've seen some studies. Uh, what was the number for somebody had a state, uh, I think it was one of the DCAP people that had a sort of the, the amount of dollars that were saved in the state of Tennessee. Because of implementing codes, you know, it's, it's big money. 
Uh, and then, of course, you might even be able to appeal to the utility and get them up. Some, in some cases, I think you have less uh, issues with your utility than we do, obviously. Um, climate change. Who was who's from the Midwest? You said you said you got to really tread carefully on that issue. Basically, I said don't talk about it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And, and I think that's important is to kind of know if that's going to push the button the wrong way, it's probably better not to go there. And then just focus on the economic benefit. The one thing that I would say to your point is we've had a lot of success bringing in manufacturers that do products in those states. And you talked about their job yep. and how much money that consumer is going to save on their house. Yep. Don't jobs. That. Jobs. Very good. I, and I think that's so. Uh, but, I, but I do think you can, at the appropriate time, kind of remind people this is important, not just from an economic side of things. Uh, and in our case, you know, my utility, or you know, we're, I think I read a statistic if you took five, Georgia, one of them, five contiguous southern states, and you lumped us together and made us a, a country, we would be the fourth most polluting nation in the world. Yes! <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, I'm so proud. So, um, and, and you spin that, you say we got a lot of opportunity to do good. We could do a lot, a lot of good stuff. Um, so I think that's you know sad and, and also opportunity. Um, the other thing is that I the one I was starting to think, what have I not heard this week? Uh, I heard a little bit about green building programs and water, but I don't think that there's much of a connection between energy and water that's, that's sort of out there. Um, and, and, and the example being, if you save water in your building, how do you save energy? If I use less water in my building, how do I save energy? What is the municipality's single largest energy bill? Water treatment, right? So if I save water in my building, I save energy downstream. And then the other thing is, uh, for, for any of us that are in the fossil fuel, you know, electric generation, if I save energy in my building, I'm saving water upstream. Because, gosh, is it a coincidence that those coal nuclear power plants are always located right next to a big body of, right? Is that a coincidence? Is it just for the view? <laughs> it's, I, I got a statistic from Ben Taub, ben, you can correct me on this, but I sort of give a range. One to three gallons of water pulled out of the river and not put back for every kilowatt hour of energy, of electricity. Is that about right? One to three gallons of water pulled out for a kilowatt hour of electricity. And then, you gotta remember, a lot of people don't know what that means. A kilo, we pay less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour for our electricity. So think about it, $100 electric bill, wow. Thousands of gallons of water. So, and it's not that the water leaves the planet Earth, but it doesn't travel down the river. So, I think that's an important connection to make: that, that energy savings equals water savings, water savings equals energy savings. I think that's a that's a missing link. Um, okay, <laughs> if you want, what is it? Ninety percent compliance of the energy code. The programs that guarantee you one hundred percent energy code compliance are available. And, and I, I know we have touched on this, but connect the dots. 100% compliance. Every Earthcraft home is 100% in compliance with the energy code. And, the, and I'm saying Earthcraft, that's, that's our every lead for home, every energy star. They are 100% in compliance with the energy code. Wow. If I'm trying to get the numbers up, which I think I'm trying to get the numbers up, right? Because I'm trying to sort of. If I, if I give you millions of dollars, I, you agree to try to get the numbers up. Okay, so I think this is a big thing. Uh, we, ought to, we ought to remember that. Um, and then, <clears throat> I, I very much believe in this today. I didn't at one time. But there is a big difference between a building that is built to, I'm going to use this example, lead standards versus one that is actually certified. I, The argument is certified versus, what am I writing? Hmm, what does that mean? That means if someone is checking up 
on me and really looking at my work, I actually will do the things I'm supposed to do. If I just set a, uh, oh yeah, I build it to this standard. And it, for some reason, schools always get into this laundry. They, they can't afford the, I think the, the certification fees are in the neighborhood of three and a half cents a square foot. That's the money that goes to the USGBC. Now there's other fees, and, and, but you know, it typically is, it's probably, you're talking 50 cents a square foot, worst case. For, what's, what does the school cost today? $100 a square foot? Huh? More? I mean, I, I'm trying to be conservative here. So I'm, depending on how you want to look at it, it's three and a half cents a square foot. With all the fees and bells and whistles, 50 cents a square foot to get a project that really does work. So do, do you understand my connection here with what I wrote? Does that? Okay. All right, we'll move on. Uh, I, I do think that there is a, there is importance to those to actual certification because I think um, it's kind of like duct testing. Oh, let's connect the dot. Okay, I like this. Duct testing. I read this somewhere. This is brilliant. There's three kinds of duct systems in homes. There's regular, there's sealed, and then there's sealed and tested. What does that mean? There's regular, there's sealed, you know, we seal them, and then they're sealed and tested. If you know someone is coming behind you to verify that the ducts are tight, guess what? You actually seal them. What is, what's the threshold on duct leakage in 09? What is it? It's like 12%? Oh my gosh, that is so ridiculous. I mean, that you can spit on ducks and probably get them to 12. I think Mark said the same thing. So, in other words, uh, the standard right now is too too easy. But that's okay. Let's get it in place, and then and then we'll play it in another version of the code. We'll ratchet that that percentage down. Uh, you know, we every every home in these programs has to get under at least six percent, and and typically they're coming at three. And of course, maybe it'll push us to get the ducks inside. So it can be done. It can be done. It can be done. Um, okay, uh, some slides. By the way, code's been around a long time. Did you know that? Anybody seen this before? This is like the original DOE code right here, I think. This is from Hammurabi right here. The earliest known code of law. And actually, this section always appeals to me, section 239. So I translated it. It says, if a builder builds a house and his work is not strong and the house falls in, the builder shall be slain. <laughs> Actually, that's our new Georgia code enforcement. Everybody, every building official gets a gun. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so a building that just meets code is, remember that, it's, it's the bottom of the barrel. Um, so we're focusing on the bottom of the barrel, but those high performance buildings take the other extreme, they drag. So we're pushing and we're dragging. We're trying to make change, pushing and dragging. Uh, build the stakeholder. Uh, this, these are slides that are from my presentation of training. So um, build the stakeholders, appreciate the stakeholders. And, uh, and get them involved in, in actually helping people show up. That was probably the most important thing, is to get these different entities uh, to come and, and help us promote this and get people to these workshops and get people to get involved. Any questions? I'm sorry. Uh, Georgia Power? That's a, one of the southern companies. And, and to their credit, they were a big help on this. They, they actually printed all their code workbooks. They helped promote it. And, so it's, a, it's an interesting, I think there's sort of, I'm gonna get in trouble for this. All right, so I look out my we, south face, we look at our building due south, and we see this giant black skyscraper, and it's the Southern Company building, and it's also Georgia Power. And honestly, if, I think if we could sort of remove the top five floors, which is kind of Southern Company, then we'd be in great shape. Okay, absolutely. All right. <laughs> Please don't tell anybody in Georgia the same thing. How do you get them to engage? Do they get credit for the commission for it? Or is there any other goodwill? Or well, how do you tell? Uh, well, the Southern Company is a, I don't know, so much trouble. They're a big blue chip stock company. They, you know, it's all about paying dividends. And, and you know, they, they do just enough to stay out of trouble. But they're not progressive. And, you know, they're, to sell renewable energy. They wanted to say, we offer uh, Green E certified energy. What did, they, did they go out and build plants that were renewable energy? They just bought somebody else's plants. So, um, uh, but, but to their credit, 
you know, they really helped us in the early days before we had a code, we had a, a good sense program. And that good sense program was, was effectively became the 95 model energy code. And so, I mean, that does, it's just this strange, you know, relationship. And I think, like I said, it's, I think that that utility on the higher up level is not appreciated climate change and obviously spent millions of dollars fighting it. Um, but I think that there are people within the organization that are very proactive and, and very you know, motivated. So it's a, it's a complicated world, um, effective change. Uh, just to show you, I, I, think it's, I think it's important to give people a roadmap uh, of how the code lays out and really just say, look, we're, we're going to focus as a residential workshop on chapter four. And this is a big thing. The, I, probably no one from the ICC is still here. Is anybody from the ICC still here? Um, they were fantastic. Because I looked at this, anybody have this 2006 codebook? Anybody have it? Raise your hand if you have this codebook. Somewhere. In, yeah. in your pants. You have it. Um, so uh, <laughs> the codebook, if you look, at, thank you, if you look at it, there's only four pages that matter. Two pieces of paper if you print them front and back. It's chapter four, section 401 through 403. It's, it's that easy. And, and so we asked the, I, the ICC folks, could we please copy four pages and hand those out? And they said yes. And, and so if you want the code to be effective, you gotta get the code in the hands of the people using it. And you know, frankly, I, I, the ICC codes aren't that expensive. One, you know, probably like, how much do they sell this code for? 20 bucks? You know, times are tough, you gotta raise your fees. Um, uh, so anyway, the new one, the 2009 is how much? 30 bucks? But sometimes you can get a discount, you know. Um, but, but, you know, what we found is that we're like, look, if you get the code out there, more people are gonna use it, Probably you're going to sell more code books. And, and they were fine. They were great ones. Um, so they helped us print these the four pages that really matter. And um, we did a similar thing with ASHRAE. This was back in uh, 2003 or so. Georgia adopted, at that time, the 2000 IECC, which referenced ASHRAE 90.1. And we went with the 2001 version of ASHRAE 9.1. And we said, look, Ashray, you're selling this book for $100. How many people do you think, or how many code officials do you think are really going to buy this? And, and at the time, at least, they said, you know what, you're right. They, they made it so you could view the code for free on their website. Now, I don't know if that's still there, but I, you know, I, I realize Ashray and, and ICC make money selling code books or standards, but if it's out there and prevalent and user and usable, I think you're going to have much better penetration of it. And so, to their credit, Ashray went for the you know the advanced energy design guides. You can buy them or you can download them for free, and, and that's what Ron Jarnigan showed. I, I, and that I, I would like to think that maybe they listened a little bit. And what? Four point font. Four point font. <laughs> well, you know, it's all about teasing you. Here's a little bit for free. You know, we got you hooked, now you're going to buy it. But free and 4.5. So anyway, I think that's important, get the code out there. Um, uh, just slides kind of showing how to, what complies, and again, pictures, pictures, pictures. Um, hey, you know there's something, in spite of the fact that I come from a state where we put cars on cinder blocks, we, no, we, um, we actually are stronger than the code on a really important part of the building envelope that I can't believe that the ICC ignores. And that's, and, and I love what Texas calls it. They call it the hot wall. I, we call it generically an attic knee wall. Attic knee wall. It means it's a wall that's got conditioned space on one side and attic on the other. Why, if I live in, well, if I live in Portland, Oregon, and it gets really hot, I don't know. Why, if I live in the south in particular, should I insulate that wall to the same value as the one to the exterior? How hot does it get in an attic? I know we covered that yesterday, or Mark talked about it, right? I was doing this training in Alabama one time, Karen, and I said, how hot does it get in the attic? And this guy, 8,000 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that will always stick in my brain. It's like, oh yeah, that's a blast. So, you know, maybe we ought to do better on that wall. And so that, that's something, I'm very proud of that. We actually, require, and I'll explain why, R18 
in an agony wall plus a sheathing and a solid air barrier on the attic side and maybe the new code is catching up to this at least on the air ceiling side but I don't think it's, it's required on that. Um, in a cold climate probably not a big deal. It's a buffered space but in, in a southern climate definitely. Uh, the, the zones we work in and again it's um, this is fascinating to me. Georgia has three climate zones. Alabama has two climate zones. South Carolina has one climate zone. It's like, wow, I gotta build the same house in Charleston that I would build in Greenville. I, you know, I, I, it's this trade-off of easy versus you know, how, how thin do you slice the lemon? But I don't know, I kind of wish South Carolina had two climate zones. North Carolina, does anybody remember how, if you looked at this, it was classic. North Carolina in the old climate zones used to have a zone that split between Raleigh and Durham. Yes. So, I mean, I, I really compliment the efforts to simplify the code because, frankly, I would rather have a simplified code that is 90% in effect than the best code out there that is uh, 2%, right? We all agree on that. So, simple, good. That's, that's important. Um, just talking about this, you know, the, the, the sections. What was great about giving everybody those four pages of handouts next to all the slides that I'm showing is they they could use it as a roadmap. And and some people love code language, and so you're giving them what their fits. But you're you're also allowing them to walk through it. And we can say, look, here's where the certificate requirement. Everybody remember the certificate requirement? Um, here's where we added something. We said, oh, you can put information about the load calc. Ooh, that's interesting. The low calc, oh. and you have to put the name, the person's name on it. We had a guy named J. Manuelo, uh, nothing, uh, Manuel J. Uh, so, sorry, uh, whoosh. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and trying to just basically emphasize. Here's an example. We filled an example. We need to go further though. We need a very simple fillable PDF file and that you can just print your label and we're not there yet. So that's, that's kind of the things. User-friendly code means implemented code. You might make you chant that later, so we'll hang on to that. We teach building science. This is where we, we talked about the code a little bit. Okay, we're gonna explain just very quickly why this stuff is in the code. This is where you can really, you can really have a good time. So we talk about heat, air, and moisture, and probably not as much on moisture. Um, we talked about the house as a system. Uh, to win the game, you need to do three things. Good envelope, good mechanicals, that includes ductwork, intentional ventilation, and uh, oh yeah, deal with moisture. Yeah, oh yeah. So four things. Um, but this is all beefing up what's in the code. And then uh, some people have never seen a blower door test, or a duct blaster test, duct leaked blower too. Uh, how, do, how, do, how do you handle a house that's quote too tight? Put in ventilation. How do you do it? Put a small duct to there. Again. Um, uh, we teach heat transfer. I like um, to show pictures. When I teach heat transfer, I want some sort of a visual that really kind of expresses heat transfer like I could never do. <laughs> okay. okay, so, um, yeah, don't, yeah, be careful. Uh, so, watch it again. Okay, my favorite part is, is, is watch, watch the guy. Like, watch the guy on the left. Oh man, your hair's up. I'm not touching that. <laughs> so, anyway, all right, so heat transfer. Very important. To conduction, to all itself, to all, and all, and all the great stuff from explaining radiant barriers. Um, I'm going to remind you of this picture, radiant barriers, um, because I, we have this saying about radiant barriers. So for, for those of you in cold climates, don't worry about radiant barriers, but for you know, warmer climates, especially if your stocks are in the attic. Radiant barriers can keep your attic cooler, and it's great to talk about them. The real reason we encourage builders to install them is because they're shiny. So if you take nothing else away from you this week, remember that, write this down, people like shiny things. <laughs> people like shiny things. And, uh, hey, I'm a, ooh, look, it looks like a rocket ship up here. I'm gonna buy this house, it's shiny up here. And it's also cooler in the attic. So, um, you know, explaining this and, and offering this, I, we like we try to give a little homework, but not homework problem, an in-class problem, and talk about it. This is a great slide to talk about radiation, conduction, radiation, convection, and uh, uh, we can also get into this. We can talk about the issue of, of spray foam on the roof line, which 
gosh, 10 or so years ago was a pretty radical thing, but today it's much more commonplace. And you can talk about the benefits if the depth of time. Um, <clears throat> we talk about air movement, and I'm, I'm not trying to teach you this, I'm just saying this is what we cover. And then after we kind of set that up, we go into the code and what the code offers us in terms of options with compliance. I, I fully stole this from Rosemarie, thank, thank you. Did you create this originally? Yes, yeah, awesome. Got a lot of mileage. I think it was like ten or something years ago. Yeah. I just I just changed the colors every so often, right? But uh, anyway, so um, you know, you got the prescriptive chart, you got the trade-off, and then you got the real trade-off. Um, so again, how can I get this concept across to understand the building envelope? Let's show pictures. We put in in our code a much better definition of building thermal envelope than what the, the ICC has. So it doesn't with it, but it explains it a lot better. I think some people don't understand what you mean when you say build the thermal envelope. We um, also created this, which is code officials, builders, whatever, whoever you are, understand that you can have three identical looking houses that all define the building envelope differently. I think that's very important to communicate that. They're all correct. They all can be done well, they all can be screwed up. So I think I think that's important, just to show the different ways to define the building envelope. Um, so again, into the chart, and this is great classic Georgia. We adopt a code, and then we take a big red pen, and we X out everything. <laughs> so yeah, we adopted that code, and you bought it, you paid 30 bucks for it, you really don't need it, because you're going to use the amendments in Georgia. So you know, we put our own table in, but it's, it's always a little simpler. ICC took two tables. We figured out you could put our value and new factor in one. Woohoo! Uh, you know, that's our paper city. Um, we added the column for knee wall. That was kind of silly. And uh, okay, yeah, there's some footnotes. So yeah, okay, footnotes too. Um, and we talk about all of that. The, um, then we demonstrate the res check. And uh, sometimes we've done this where we actually, <coughs> I got one of the building supplier companies to donate a bunch of calculators. I mean, I had a box of about 120. And so we started doing, up, I, I think we did about 15 code workshops. And every code workshop, we would say, these are loaner calculators. I need them back. And then every time we come back with a few less calculators. But we, we still managed to get through the, through the season. And uh, we gave them a problem. It was a fairly simple L-shaped building. And it was scary. How many people can't do math? And, and I don't mean that, well, at least in my state. <laughs> in Georgia, we're proud that we're usually sort of, we're, we're either first or 50th on those lists. So it, that, that could, it's a good thing or a bad thing you think about it. Um, so, uh, so anyway, the math part was was compelling. That it was interesting that you know, and then we'd walk through the problem and talk about how to do it. But it was great to see people struggle a little bit and, and appreciate. That was one of the things I, I think I I love ResCheck. It's a brilliant tool, but I think most people that use it use it wrong. Uh, at least uh, a lot of the submittals that we have seen people use, they use it wrong, and that's not your fault. Yet. <laughs> um, it, it, but, but people use it wrong. So, you know, I think, again, simple, simple, simple. Um, that's a value for me. We talk about, some, again, with pictures. What, is the, what do these things in the code mean? Show me with pictures. Pictures, 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 pictures. Explain that if the prescriptive code says R30 and you want to spray foam, you have to do a trade off. Explain that, make that very clear. Okay, that's all right, you can do it. You gotta do a trail, because you're gonna typically spray R20. Um, mask walls and like, you know, framing. Again, I think this, this picture says a thousand words to people. After we've talked about the alignment of the air barrier and the thermal barrier, do you ever see this in construction? Everybody's like, oh yeah, yeah. You see how it doesn't work? Yeah. So I think that's a powerful statement right there. This, this is essentially not insulated at all. Um, so uh, basically, you know, foundation walls and how to insulate basements, and we're in a very high termite infestation zone. Pretty much as how many days have I been here? I'll be here, I think, a total of nine days. If we have friends in Portland, when I come home, my house will be gone because of the termites. <laughs> so, it's it's the it's the. What's funny is, here, has anybody ever looked at the map for termite infestation? Apparently, the termites they. It's South Carolina, North Carolina. North Carolina is a medium 
infestation zone. South Carolina is really good. So they don't like to cross the border. I'd like to know what's on the border. So it's like, <laughs> that would be fascinating. Um, crawl spaces. This was, a, this was amazing, the crawl space issues. Um, but here's how we came up with a means of explaining it, was to draw little pictures. Because we kept trying to describe it, and the code does not describe it all that clearly. It's basically, you can do crawl spaces in three ways. You can do your classic underfloor insulation with vents. You shouldn't do that in where I live, because if you vent in Georgia, what are you letting in? <laughs> Maybe no, they, they actually just chew them. You're letting in moisture, so um, so don't do that. But but okay, if you want to, you can do a closed crawl space with underfloor insulation, or we prefer the closed crawl space with insulation on walls. It gets the ducts inside, but that creates havoc for the pest control people. I'll get us. I'll, I'll, I'll not get in trouble with pest control people today. But pest control, dangerous, dangerous, high amounts of political clout and the and, and connections. Very little building science knowledge, at least in our state. So basically, these are people that it's a good old boy network. We made a lot of money over the years, and we'll continue to make a lot of money over the years dumping chemicals into your foundation. There have got to be better ways. So yes, we had some issues with that. Um, we compromised and worked it all, you know, blah blah blah. So what's ironic is that was probably the most contentious thing in our last code cycle is this whole crawl space wall insulation, and in the end. No one builds crawl spaces in Georgia anymore. It's, it's really entertaining. No one builds. They build tons of them in North Carolina, but it's it's all basements or slabs, pretty much. Um, so it's it's fun. We we there's a great video that you can get that is from the Advanced Energy talking about their crawl space study that talks about this graph. Anybody seen this graph before? Talking about a closed crawl space versus a vented crawl space and moisture levels, and you look excited. Okay. Um, we talked about windows, and uh, we talked about and, and window, how they work, and I think, again, you know, what's this magic glowy pixie dust do for me? So I think that's all. Uh, okay. Um, attic access. Uh, air sealing. This is one area where I think I'm proud of, because I think our code was a little bit ahead of the, ahead of the curve on this, is probably, again, because I'm from Georgia. We don't like to read, but we like to look at pictures. So we said, how do you enforce air sealing? You show a lot of pictures of how to do it. So we, we took this and built on it. We um, also mentioned, you know, we, just, we cleaned up this issue with can lights a long time ago. You, you can't build a box, so no one never does that. So you have to do it. And, and I think the new code fixes as well. So we were, you know, I'm, 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 as backwards as we are, we actually have been ahead of the game on something. Uh, we built it, we made a poster that was really cool, and then we said, you know what, we should make this into a flip chart. So it, we're talking about big holes, and we take a big flip chart, so it'll have this, this graphic, pretty big, where you can print it out, and you can look at it, and you can read it, and understand it. It's been translated into Spanish. Um, and uh, here's, let me just give you an example. How would I present this one section of your art? Okay, so, um, okay, a classic hole in the building envelope is when you have uh, a hole for the, the pipe that goes from the drain of the tub. And you may not know this, but it's in the plumbing code that this hole has to be cut large enough so a plumber can pass a six pack through to the other one. <laughs> uh, that has to be sealed because, and you can't put it, you can't put a fiberglass bat there because that's not an air barrier. And uh, <clears throat> we like this home where, as we found it, they had phoned the plumbing penetrations for these lines, but left the hole here. <laughs> because of the sick pack. So, <laughs> so, lots of ways you can fix that, et cetera, et cetera. And then I start, and I, and I, I kind of tell my story. I had, I checked under, our house was built in 1920, and it's old. I checked, and I had this hole under my tub. It was pretty scary. And uh, I'm not sure what was holding the tub up, honestly, but it was actually structurally supported, which is good. Um, and that's an interior wall. And so fixing it, you know, low tech, but very effective. And it was not just energy, it was, uh, I didn't want to breathe crawl space here. Okay, <coughs> where I'm from, you go in a crawl space, we have these things called camel crickets or cave crickets, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. They're big, yes? No, no you don't know the <laughs> they're, they're carried weapons, they have knives. They're, they are scary. And I'm crawling, I hate being in crawl spaces. I'm crawling on my back, I'm trying to air seal under my tub. 
and, and all of a sudden one of these cave crickets like starts gnawing on my leg and I am freaking out. <laughs> Turned out it's a dog. So it's a good dog. follow me in. That's, that's my dog. Uh, it's, it's up close and that's my weird dog. Um, the other story I can tell is just you know, about unsealed plumbing penetrations. We were doing this habitat blitz build in uh, rural Appalachia, you know, long, this is probably here, 96. And, uh, and we were staying in this kind of like Norman Bates hotel, are you getting the visual? And so like we're staying here and uh, Stephanie, who now works at Building Science, she used to be one of our interns at South Bates, she, um, she was in a room and uh, she was like, she was like, she was, hey guys, you want to see him catch his name? Sure, what do you do in the world tendencies after a long day of building? Maybe. So we go in and, and the snake, the, the, the hotel manager said, Oh, don't worry, darling, I'll take care of that for you. He walks into the room and he sees the snake and runs away because the snake was a python. Oh. <laughs> so, which, by the way, is not indigenous to rural Appalachia in Tennessee. You know that. How did the python get there? It got there because staying in the same hotel, three doors down, was a traveling reptile ship. And the, the snake had crawled through and sealed plumbing penetrations through the plumbing wall and popped up in Stephanie's room. I mean, just, it's a great air sealing story. So air sealing, besides helping on energy, stops critters, some of which could be five feet long. Okay, all right, so make it fun. Uh, so air sealing and air sealing and air sealing. I love this picture. This is a Pulitzer Prize winning photo of a moisture problem that's going to occur in this house before the house. You can see it when the house is built. Here's a, a, a tub set against an exterior wall, you know, shed roof, vented attic space, and um, usually though, when your phone goes off in the training, I make you rub fiberglass on your arm for <laughs> um, So it's it's a uh, so here you see the moist air coming in, getting in between the conditioned floors, and you know what's funny is is trying to explain this to people. You, you can see, oh yeah, people like nodding their heads and you like, I see that. And what'll be interesting is the call that South Face will get. Uh, I've got mold growing in my trim kit, in my kitchen, and you know, where's the moisture coming from? I've got, I got spots in my ceiling, and it's a plumbing leak. Well, it's condensing on those pipes right in there. And it's like, where's the source? It's an airplane. And you know, I know this would never happen in Minnesota because you're on it, but uh, that's a, I think that's just a great thing. All right, I'm not gonna spend any more time on it. Just, just trying to show with pictures, ag knee walls, definitely very, very important for we are. How hot behind the attic? Do you remember? Yeah. Oh, excellent. You, you've become the cycle. Um, attic access and basement attachments and things like that. Um, moisture, thank goodness. Uh, with all due respect for the guy from New York, thank goodness. Vapor retarders have been taken out of the code uh, until you get to where people talk about it. <laughs> By the way, when I talk about the Southeast, you know, we don't include Florida. You know why? Because they talk about them. <laughs> they're from Michigan and New York and Canada. It's, 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 they're, they're, and they're their own country, and they do actually great stuff. So, you know, they, they got it here. I'm important. Um, we also did some things, and I would encourage you this. There are trade-off capabilities uh, that you can do easily with ResCheck. Um, one of the things that we felt very important to spell out that you, you can't trade something to zero. I might put in a really efficient heating and cooling system, ground source heat pump, and say, okay, I can not insulate my roof. And you know, no, you can't do that. So there's a prescriptive value that you might be able to trade off, but we said there's, there's got to be a lower threshold. So I think that's good to spell that out. Any roof has to, at a minimum, you cannot trade it lower than R19, just as an example. Um, and then I'm not going to spend much time on mechanicals. A lot of the mechanical stuff got yanked out of the energy code and put into um, the uh, mechanical code. So if we were able to put this information on the mechanical code. Yeah. So uh, I think that's important. And then, and then talking about the, the last section, of course, the, the, HERS, the HERS radar approach. And this is where you want to build some crazy building. So uh, the code on the stick was my great approach and my great um, desire to, to see. I stole that term from someone out west. But it's, it, we were getting there because it's simple. It was it you? Paul was it you? Thank you. I stole it from you. But this is your ripple effect. You traveled across the country to get the code on the stick. And I always explain what that means to people because they didn't hear it from me. 
But, um, but they like, yeah, if we make it simple, we can figure this out. So there's one answer for Georgia in, in, in a given class. Um, make it simple. Make, it, make the code simple, got a better chance at enforcement. Um, the last thing, uh, uh, Enrica, I want to, is Eric Lacey? There you are, Eric, thank you. I wanted to um, emphasize that, uh, you know, outside groups, and we've heard, we've heard from BCAP and PNNL a lot, but I want to emphasize that Enrica has been very helpful for us. And then again, some outside resources that come in to help you. Um, our panelists, well, okay, here's my plan. I'm going to have Bruce, who has to leave now in six minutes. And, uh, and and Eric, would you like to be the still the one panel? Actually, you're going to be the judge now. <laughs> okay, so Eric's going to be the judge, and you've been very passive all week long, having to listen to presenters. So we're going to try something a little different. And and this is an exercise I literally I've spent hours inventing this morning. And uh, it, we're going to this exercise is called I got six. I got six. So what you have to do is you have to get together with five other people to form a group of six people, okay? And I'm going to explain it. This is how small group exercises. I explain everything to you. You forget what I said, and then you have to read it on the board. So you're going to get with five people, and you're going to, you're going to, you're going to introduce yourself, and you're going to need to come up with a team name in this process. So that, that, that'll be, that's your chance to be creative. And then I'm going to give you six minutes and your group has to come up with some innovative implementation concept or strategy that maybe just something radical that we can have a good time with. Okay? Let me explain it one more time. So you're going to stand up, and everybody in this room has to play. Gene, I'm counting. Everybody has to play, it, including PNL people. If you don't want to play, Sean, you have to leave the room. All right, you can't cover up your face. All right, so uh, are you ready? Do you, do you understand? Let me say it one more time. What's the first thing we're going to do? You can stand up and get in a group of six. Okay, that's ten. And you get you get to introduce yourself and come up with your team name, and then then I'm gonna say, okay, go. You get your six minutes. Come up with an idea, and you have to write it down. And Eric, we're gonna have everybody present it, and, and I'm gonna let Eric be the judge. Tough judge. He's a tough judge. And uh, um, I think you know, let's, let's give it a shot. You can cream me on the email too. Let's give it a shot. Right, stand up and give us six people or five of them.
Okay, time is up. We're going to need a representative from each of your groups to present it. Oh boy. And uh, preferably someone that has not already been speaking at this conference. Oh boy. So we want a representative of your group. Okay, if you can grab your seats back, otherwise I'm going to get roast. Sit down. Okay, that's our group. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Oh, sit back in your group. That's better. Sit back down. That's we, we, uh, I think we had about 10 groups. I wasn't, I forgot to count. But we're going to start off um, in the back of the room with our strict, strongly PNNL group, I think is what you call it. Who is your spokesperson? Someone that hasn't spoken? Oh. All right. And uh, do we have another mic? Or we can just uh, it's more. And you're going to need to tell us your name and your team name. And uh, who wants to go? All right, Eric, you ready? My name is Emily Schenkel, and our team is Gene Bolin and the Codex. <laughs> <laughs> our idea was to make a rap music video and then put it on MTV, YouTube, MySpace, and Facebook, and also to create an infomercial. An infomercial. Yes. Excellent. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to scribe it all down, and then we're going to put it to the group as a, uh, as a you know, die or no die kind of gladiator. Which, uh, no, you can't vote yet. So. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, who's the next team we have uh, over in this area? What's your name and your team? Uh, my name is Mike, and our team is the MNOs for uh, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, New Mexico, Oregon, Washington. We got rid of the Washington. <laughs> w Sun. And uh, this is a uh, code implementation concept for existing buildings that don't comply with energy. And we're going to implement a dress code for climate responsibles. So, kind of an energy dress code, I think is what I heard. Climate responsive dress code. And is there going to be a no thong provision? Or... <laughs> right, so, well, that has to go to the table. Only for you. Very good. <laughs> oh, thank you. All right, Bob. Okay, uh, we, we were one short, then we got a six member, and then one of our members left. So now we're back to one short. That's our name. One short. One short. And uh, although I don't know much about cap and trade, not sure I support it, we're, we're going to use that. Uh, Cap and trade, where you have give points, but you have to if you don't comply with the provisions of the code, you have to buy it out. To okay, you basically pay for not complying with. Like pay to be an energy hog. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So one short. Thing over there. Who's next? Over here. Okay. And. We were team Tough Love. Tough Love. <laughs> um, we came up with a build your survivor, kind of like the show survivor, um, home simulation where they have to build their home at like some competition without knowing that they will have to live in that home. And um, to survive extreme simulations of either for an X amount of time of either an Alaska winter or an Atlanta summer. Or have a Portland summer. A Portland summer. And then we would throw in extreme challenges like snakes and toxic gas during that period of time. And if they, so then that way, you know, they'd know the houses they were building. I'm liking it. So it's, it's kind of energy code survivor, big brother. Got it. Hello. Hello. Okay. Next, next, who's another team? Oh, I'm sorry. Dave. Hand up. Dave. Dave. Who's the spokesperson? Dave. I guess I was elected. Uh, we had James Garner, uh, Clint Eastwood, uh, Donald Sutherland, and Tommy Lee Jones. We're Team Davis uh, from Space Cowboys. Uh, Davis. Anyway, the uh, the idea to improve implementation compliance was uh, you have a lot of metering capability, 
you put an LCD by the front door, let's say a retail building, and it's going to show on one screen how much is renewable coming in and how much is non-renewable coming in. And as those numbers kind of uh, spread apart, or the renewables are zero and the non-renewables are very large, or you're getting away from net zero, um, in a retail establishment, the price of the products starts to go up a little bit, and when you get to a certain point, the front door automatically closes and locks. Okay? So basically, as you're exceeding your budget, you're losing your business. There's an office space where that's not really possible. You have the fire alarm, the sprinklers, the, the elevator shut down, and everybody has to leave. Or you have a metric where that's tied into a metric of your paycheck. So as those numbers are getting off whack, then if you're in the consulting business, your paycheck starts to go down as those numbers get out of whack. I think the black reading the operative word, but I like it. I like it a lot. So did you catch that, Eric? LCD display with renewables and non-renewables in real time. All right, who's next? Okay. All right, Terry, we didn't draw an order. All right. What's your key? Okay, we are the, in deference to all of the acronyms that I can't remember, but I can remember a few. We are ELFC, the Eric Lacey Fan Club. And we thought we might be able to reach the next generation <laughs> on YouTube with videos and online videos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we uh, also thought about uh, using an iPhone and going online. And the main thing is, is that we have to reach the people who are actually able to afford the houses to live in them. Don't need to reduce the Etc. commercial buildings, and so we can see something not very nice, a port. Like when the uh, gas meter readers ride around on the segways and read your gas meter, they can just plug into a port on your house and say, hmm. <laughs> <Shut up. laughs> <That's it. laughs> so, uh, Stalinism, I think, is right. <laughs> stick approach. So, so you can be stupid, but you will pay. I mean, that's really all. Uh, so the idea is that if you, uh, a bond would be have, uh, would have to be posted by the developer, uh, mess with, with you know, we typically find out what's for ourselves, under uh, Given the, if the building, and then there would be a and uh, the requirement, uh, so monitoring and requirements that be attached to it. If the building underperforms, the bonds retain in some uh, proportion fashion, and problems need to be fixed. Uh, if the carrots are, if the building outperforms, there's there's potential money to be had. Uh, there's a couple of options as far as how you can, if you outperform a certain percentage, you can uh, you can share the savings with the operator or, or the uh, tenant. Uh, right, so if your building underperforms, you forfeit your bond or at least part of it. And if your building overperforms, you uh, get your money back and maybe get some of the penalties that others didn't get back. Something like that. I love it. Love it. Very good. Okay. Anybody up here? Paul. Oh. We need to come up with the name of Shell Prime. The fact, Selva Prime. Selva Prime meaning the Selva Prime, as in some of the loan problems now caused by lenders doing some things. So we think there's going to be changes in the way home financing. So our plan is that any federal, any loan type, any type of federal funding, that the requirement will be that the federal government or any the lending institution insists on a, a copy of the label, inspecting for the label builder of self-certified the home, that any federal funding is tied with compliance with the energy code. No energy code, no funding. Ending some of the problems that the caused by the self-prime. The problem is the infrastructure. Yeah. Okay, uh, anybody else? Doug. Yeah, our team is uh, 
four guys and a chick. <laughs> And our, our idea is that uh, this may have already been done, I don't know, an energy rating system that uh, the builder tells you uh, when he's done with the building uh, the range of energy costs that you can expect in this home living in that climate. I like that idea of bonding it through. I like the bond. <laughs> okay, so the builder is going to provide you with the energy expected energy cost on any home sold. Yeah. And it's based on something like a HERS industry. So, so kind of requiring a HERS rating in essence or something like that. Okay, the second part, Karen. Yeah. Okay, any builder that builds a house that doesn't meet the code, he's gonna have to play sort of a strip poker. For every house he builds that doesn't meet code, one article of clothing comes off. Or Russian roulette, that's another option. I think that would be good. That's my uh, Although there are some builders that don't want to see me. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I was like yeah. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people applying to be code officials in that situation. Anybody else? Any other team? Uh, um, well, thanks. Thanks. And now, and now for uh, a great, uh, interesting concepts. And now I think what we're going to do is uh, have Eric walk us through them and uh, and we'll leave the, uh, this is your chance to uh, participate on the, uh, on the phone, but remember, Eric is the final authority. So. Okay, so have you seen Gladiator, when the emperor sticks his thumb out and everybody has to decide to live or die, you know, after the Gladiator is done? So we're going to play that, you know, I'm going to go through these, and if you think it should live, you say live, and, you know, you, you, may, you may survive. If you think die, you know, see the thumbs down, and we'll decide. All right, so the first one, people in the codettes, they're talking about going a more media-based approach. YouTube, rap song, live, die, stick your thumb out, and vote. Oh, let's hear it. Live, die. That's all good. We'll live that one. Oh, here we go. Oh, here we Suck it up. Okay. <laughs> Team MNO, they wanted to have an energy uh, use appropriate dress code. What do you think? Final analysis. Ooh, that's a close one. I think that one died. Oh! Oh! oh. 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 But, but A for B. Yeah, that's pretty good. Team One Short wanted to have kind of a cap and trade concept built into the code. Okay. Live, Live or die. die. Let's see your hands. Okay. Ooh, that's not looking good. Sorry. Cap and trade was a good thing. Tough love, builder survivor challenge. Live or die. So that's a win. That's a live. We've tapped into some animosity here. <laughs> Team Daedalus. Team Daedalus. Metering, renewable, non-renewable energy. There's a lockout provision if you, you know, are non-compliant. Live or die. Let's have a vote. Let's have a vote. Lowest one, it looks like live. Oh, the, emperor, the emperor has come through. Uh, team ELFC, um, we wanted to have YouTube, uh, oh, and, and a port that you'd enter in and in buildings to check on the energy. Live or die? What do you think? By default, started as a live. Uh, I think we'll let that one live. Team Bond, the idea that you can be stupid, but you'll pay for it. Uh, the Bond uh, set up for underperforming or overperforming homes. <laughs> live or die. This one, I'm going to say live on this one. That's good. <laughs> Subprime, sub did I spell that correctly? Yeah. Subprime. Uh, I'm going to have a disclosure form process. Live or die. Live, I think. Yeah. Just uh, Eric. Finally, team four guys and a chick. Uh, the expected energy costs uh, and the strip. Can, can we vote on these separately? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Someone raised a good point. Who, who really pays when this happens? Uh, live or die? Live. 
doubt your eyes out. This one got a good response. I'm about to die on that one. Sorry. And that's it. Okay, so Eric, now you're going to have to pick what you think is the clear winner, and um, and I, I think this is this is important. Because this is highly scientific this process. Uh, we're we're doing great time wise, and uh, Eric, as soon as you pick the winner, um, I forgot I was going to give prizes of some artwork for my two year old, but it, I can mail it to you. <laughs> Do you have a clear winner, Eric? We have two winners, okay. Split split decision. I have two winners. One is based on sheer uh, popularity. I'm going to say Top Club probably wins not just sheer popularity. Excellent. 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 On a technical level, kind of the, the uh, you know, kind of the innovative prize, I think goes to this bond. So thank you very much, Eric. And, uh, Thanks for, for doing something a little different, and, uh, and hopefully it was it, it spent some time. And um, before I wrap up, I, I, I guess um, I guess I want to say uh, be excited about the challenges that we're all facing. They are challenges for sure, but you know that kind of ties into my top ten lessons of, in no particular order. Um, codes are opportunities, and uh, let's let's take advantage of it. They involve change. Change equals. Does anybody remember this? Change equals pain. Change equals pain. Or anticipated pain. And, and in reality, not so bad. But, uh, you know, appreciate that. Uh, the code is, of course, the bottom of the barrel. And uh, it's kind of the carrot, or the stick approach, of course. Uh, change is hard. But the best thing about code is, um, you know, I, I just can go back to an example. A classic example was when we implemented Lobby Windows in our state, and uh, Texas had done it before us, but no other southern states had done it. And it was a very big deal. It was it was, it was important to listen to stakeholders to get input. Um, but you know, in the end, after all the the oh gosh, this is going to make a house cost three thousand. Literally, we had a builder go to the newspaper and say that it was going to cost the Average home in Atlanta to increase by three to four thousand dollars for changing the glazing to low heat, and and we asked him where did you get that number, and he goes, well, I got it from South Face. <laughs> so he said, well, there's a spec sheet that says, you know, like, yeah, we have spec sheets. It said, low heat windows will, you know, increase uh, a dollar a square foot, and of course we're talking about a dollar a square foot of glazing. And he took, he took 3,000 square foot house, 4,000 square foot house, and so he extrapolated that. So that was a great example of kind of jump numbers, and uh, Harry was talking about that a little bit. So, uh, true story. Um, uh, I appreciate that, I think this is the missing link, is that um, I have seen this happen a lot, that you know, my brother-in-law said that if you put this vent fan on, it will save energy. Okay, let's make it the code. And it's like the building science uh, stuff. I think we need that. We need that role to step up in the codes um, and, 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 and actually help the education levels. This ties into what Mark was saying. Remember, people like shiny things. They also like gadgets. That's another experience. So I want to buy something from Sharper Image that will make the air in my house clean. Are you with me? Right. I want to. I want to plug something in that gives me this. I want a gadget. And we have to be aware of that because, unfortunately, energy efficiency is about the system, including the system piece. Not the HVAC system, but the whole system, the envelope, the ducts, etc. So I think you have to be, you know, just be aware of that. But you can use shiny things to get people excited, like Ray and Barry. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, Karen, I heard Karen, Karen left, they had a really good point. Uh, in asking the ICC guy, why can't we have electronic voting? Do you remember that? Do you ever remember that? Why can't we have electronic voting? And he says, well, you know, it's, it's tough, we're trying. But the, argue, the comment was, well, there's no special interest in, in the, the final vote is, is, is code officials. But how did that code official get to that meeting? Who, who paid for them to go to that meeting? The, a special interest group, 
I'm going to be generic and say a special interest group, if you're going to vote in favor of what I want you to vote for, we'll pay for you an all expensive paid trip to Rochester. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. So um, hey, I'm trying to make a joke here, but also I think you appreciate that, that, that I really think that's a flaw in the system. But also recognize that, hey, you know, you can play within that system too. So, um, and, and in my experience, since I've, I've seen that somebody's trying to plug their own product or ban their competition, I saw that a lot on the test control stuff. And, and you know, that, these are the challenges for sure. Um, you can't trust anybody. Everybody has a, has a bias. DOE has a bias. South Face has a bias. Um, DOE, you guys got to eat this one. You're gonna, you have to own this. The whole 78 to 80 percent thing. Does anybody remember what, know what I'm talking about? That we changed the code from 78 furnaces to 80 percent furnaces. We're gonna save gajillions of, of BTUs. Is that true? Does anyone even make a 78 percent furnace? Doesn't exist. It's, so we need to, we need to own it and to say, okay, look, we screwed up. Let's fix it. And, and the bias aspect is, is always there. So appreciate that. And, and, and you know, we're building coalitions on this. My bias, I'm biased, it's all get out. I want a better house. So I may not, I may be biased against the builder in terms of first cost, because I want a better house. I want a house that will last at least 100 years. I want a house that will perform. I, I, I'm biased, I admit it. Uh, and and uh, so I think, it, pull it out. Uh, code enforcement, this is my, this is one of the things I really learned. I don't think we've had a whole lot of talk on this. It's probably pretty obvious. Code enforcement is most easily enforced at the point of sale. The only thing you can buy in this state is the legal thing to put into your house. You can only put in low windows in your state. That's all you can buy. You can, right? I, I need DOE to take it to the next level on furnaces. The only furnace you can buy is 90% plus furnace. I know that's easy for me to say, I know it's been suggested, but you want to save energy? That's, that's 10%, right? Or, you know, 80 to 90, I think that's 10%. So that's big. Uh, enforce it at the point of sale, it gets done. You can't buy a water heater that doesn't pass code. You can't buy a piece of equipment that is, you know, minimum 13 sear. So, um, very good things. Those are, those are, that makes the code official's job easy. Okay, I like that. Um, Trade-offs are great. They provide the flexibility that we want, but they drive code officials bonkers, right? I'm a, a code officials see the world as you passed and you did. We need to write codes, I appreciate that. I love trade-off, I love capability, but we really need to streamline the prescriptive. I mean, and I think we have, our, to, to the credit of the code, it's very much gone in this direction. And uh, you know, I just remember, uh, and I, again, how long have you been in this energy code world? Um, 14 years for me, that's not the longest of anybody in here, for sure, but I remember the window wall ratio tables. Does anybody remember those? You got a 12%, 15%, 18%, 21%, 25%. You got all these prescriptive packages. You got how many climate things? About 20, I don't know, it was crazy. And, and I wonder why that was not successful. So kudos to the folks that really worked hard to simplify the code. And then the last one, what do you think about this? We'll see you uh, Pictures are good. Does anyone see the irony on this slide right here? Yeah. Yes, pictures are good. All right, so the last important question. Question, yes. Uh, I just, well, I didn't want to uh, end if you had an answer. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so good. You, you're done? Okay. Um, what I saw today was a lot of good stuff, and uh, I think I'd like to leverage some of it Please. in Massachusetts. Um, the thing I would like you to do is update it to 09. Sure. Give me some money. And email it to me on Monday. Oh, okay. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Uh, we know that's coming. We absolutely know that's coming. And uh, uh, hopefully, you know, South Face will get some sort of grant money that we can do this in some state. and then. Once we do it, we're happy to share it. Absolutely. Um, if, if you liked anything in this presentation, you can get it all from the DCA website in the state of Georgia, and I'll give it to the Pete and Health folks as well. Yes, Jerry. Yeah. I'd really appreciate it if you could tell me that the problem was fixed and it's all good. It's all fixed. Good. good. Thank you. A number of years ago, not that many, we were using condensing furnaces in a large school building with the, the uh, standing scene group. <laughs> 
And uh, one of the spec writers determined that they produce hydrogen, uh, hydrogen sulfide, which is a water vapor and becomes sulfuric acid. With the metal roof, we decided it wouldn't be a good idea. Maybe they corrected the problem, but 90% can get you into other problems. I, I think the um, if you were discharging your furnace right to your metal roof, that potentially could be a problem, but I don't know any failure to that, and I wish Bruce was here because he's done so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say I know of no failures. I know of no reason why you can't and usually when we're venting we're shoving the exhaust gases out. Um, so maybe it just means you got a side vent if you got a metal roof. Gas is fairly clean burning, but uh, it's, it's possible, Jerry. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. It's a good question. Um, anybody else have any any, any other burning questions? Because I think I'm going to get the hook here in a second. Um, the rules of uh, presenting are it's all about stuff. Number one is know your stuff. Number two is know who you're stuffing. And number three is know when they're stuffed. So I'm done. <laughs>